You're listening to UCW Radio. In your face. What we got here is a failure to communicate. Oh, have I got your attention now? Me, for lack of a better word, is good. You know what I mean? Money to be made in a place like this. Money never sleeps, pal. You're crazy. Don't run when you lose. Don't whine when it hurts. You know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass, 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 brass. I'm falling, and I can't get up! Welcome to Money Never Sleeps, the show where we touch on anything and everything that impacts the flow of money from around the corner to around the world. And it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and taking that into consideration later on during the show, we will be bringing on a special guest. She's not a big entrepreneur, she's not a mogul, she's not a doctor trying to find a cure for cancer, not a scientist. She's a breast cancer survivor herself, and she created a garment called Hug Wraps that actually gives comfort to patients with long hospital stays. I like the product, I like the concept, and you know, you'll find out more uh, when we bring her on. But her name is Brenda Jones, and we'll have her on a little bit later during the show. Now, another great guest that will be coming on uh, in, in a little while is one of the top matchmakers in the business. Yeah, I'm talking about the dating industry, and it is an industry. It's a billion-dollar revenue-generating machine. And we will be joined by the lovely Tiffany Brown, uh, to talk about the industry and more specifically about what she does. And now, um, last week was a whirlwind. And I just want to talk about the markets for a little while because, you know, you had, you had the jitters going on. You had ups and downs and sideways. You had just madness. But I, I want to say it on the show that a correction is healthy. Definitely healthy. It shakes things up. It creates buying opportunities and allows for stocks to breathe. Yeah, just like fine wines, stocks to breathe in order to have a a steady public trading growth. If a stock goes up in a straight line, you you can bet your bottom dollar that the shorts are licking their chops. They're waiting to strike like a scorpion or like jaws for that matter, just waiting. Uh, so, you know, panic is never a good thing. And if you're an investor, then you're looking for those opportunities to get in. You know, stocks come down, it's a buying opportunity because you, you're not selling tomorrow. If you're a trader, then you're in your glory because now your adrenaline is rushing and you, you have your hustle on because a lot of trading opportunities on the upside and the downside. And, uh, look, if you, if you're an investor and you're watching the day to day, you don't want to do that. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's stressful because you're not a trader, but you're, you're doing what a trader might be doing, but you're not actually trading. So you'll get sick to your stomach. You know, if you have, if look, if you're in for the long haul, chances are you have a good financial advisor that's going to guide you through the turbulent times. Listen to them. Okay, you need to take it in and relax as long as they're a good financial advisor. If they're not guiding you through the turbulent times, then find somebody that will. Trust me, that there is enough. There, there are tens of thousands of financial advisors in the United States that can help you. So uh, if one doesn't work, you can find another one. So just uh, make sure that they work for you. Now, that we established that a correction in any market is healthy. It can be the market as a whole. It can be an individual stock. Uh, having a good broad view of an industry, it helps out a lot because it gives you tools that, that, that allow you to connect the dots. So if you're in an, in an industry and you understand it well, you may see something that other people don't see. And it allows you to actually target stocks that may benefit that are publicly traded. You know, uh, I just want to throw this, for instance, out there. You know, you have a lot of, a lot of speculators. They're racing for the next big stock that may be a beneficiary as the, Ob- Ob- uh, the Ebola crisis, uh, heats up. It, this is like insane. 
you know, this is not an epidemic in the United States. Man, you know, it's not an epidemic in any other country other than West Africa and a couple of countries in West Africa. It's not even the whole of West Africa. This is the first point. Okay, for anyone listening to the show that is freaking out with the OEB, the Ebola crisis, I lived in West Africa for a time. If people really knew the living conditions in some regions, they wouldn't be surprised of an outbreak of any disease. This is just, you know, the one that came back home, came back to roost. And as a humanist, I, I do want a quick cure for Ebola to come into play to help those people in West Africa that can't afford the medical treatment, but is that going to shake things up enough to give a massive boost to the company that develops it? In my opinion, not really. It's a great idea, but I don't see this as being uh, a, tr a truly viable long-term investment. Uh, if you find that type of company, perhaps for a trading pop, but it could come back to bite you potentially if you're not on top of it. So all the media hype will, you know, will keep everything in front of us, you know, because that's newsworthy and it sells papers and it gets people watching TV. Uh, I really don't see it as being a major investment opportunity as the media paints the picture of an impending global disaster. Da 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 da. The gloom and doom of a, you know, or head fake as I call it, is a distraction from, from more pressing issues in the geopolitical arena. Uh, hey, and I, and I, I say this, you know, if, if you're a movie person, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Sw Swordfish, that's what kind of comes to mind, uh, uh, to me. Uh, that story, John Travolta, Hugh Jackman, Haley Berry, you know, if you haven't, go, go, go get it on, uh, well, you probably can get it on Netflix, uh, Swordfish, and, uh, if not, just watch it, and you'll understand why I mention it, and you'll probably get a chuckle, uh, because things like that, you know, I mean, who, who knows what's happening out there. Now, moving on, I wanted to bring on a guest to talk about the cannabis industry, uh, I was waiting on feedback from the Beverly Hills Cannabis Queen, Cheryl Schumann, but she didn't get back to me in time for the show. So hopefully we can have her on in the coming weeks. But uh, let me just touch on the cannabis industry and a couple of companies that are becoming very innovative with uh, creating viable products for the industry. Now, I just want to voice my opinion on the topic because I have to give my opinion on, on, you know, legalizing cannabis. You know, look, the bottom line is legal, legalizing cannabis could potentially add billions of dollars of much needed revenue and ta and it, it's, the tax dollars that are going to come out of it is going to put tax dollars to work in this country. The regulation around it is what is interesting. They need a weed czar. And that would probably be a cool title that you are the weeds are. I wonder who that would be. Probably get Snoop Dogg or something. I don't know. But you seriously, you need a weeds are uh, to take hold of this one. Uh, right now, it's legal in certain states, and that's important. You know, and that's an important thing because it's legal on a state level, but not on a federal level. And that's the paradox. That's that's what's interesting here. Uh, it makes it a little difficult to build an industry the way it needs to be built. And I'm sure that they'll figure it out soon enough. You know, look, they just have to look back at the history of, uh, look back at history. Look at the Volstead Act. Look at what happened when it was in place. Okay, it made, it made, it's, it's, and I'm just saying it, it made American mobsters wealthy because of the Volstead Act. Now look at the benefits that occurred after it was removed and how much money was generated for the government and helping the people with, with social programs, everything else. So you got to look at that. So people have their own opinion and they'll, they'll bring out the, they'll, you have naysayers, they'll bring out the negativity and everything else, but you got to look at the good that comes out of it because no good deed goes unpunished and you got to take the good with the bad. Nothing's foolproof in this world. Uh, legalizing cannabis could very well reduce smuggling of marijuana from out of the country. And that could be, that can be good. Uh, it can create many jobs. 
you know, maybe people that, that don't want to work at McDonald's or maybe they don't want to do this or they don't, they don't want to go shovel dirt or whatever it is, you know, this can help, you know, you know, fill, fill jobs and get people back to work. That can be interesting. Uh, it could allow for growth in small, in the small business arena beyond this industry. And I'm going to tell you why. My, th- these are my thoughts. If money is flowing, then the beneficiaries of the legalization of cannabis will be putting those profits to work. And what are they going to do? Are they going to reinvest it in their company? Sure, they're going to reinvest it in their company, but they're also going to diversify because they un- they're going to understand how important that is. If they're in that business, they understand diversification. Anyhow, you know, beyond me going on a tangent, what I see probably, you know, with, with, with this happening is that they'll diversify, maybe open up smaller business, help fund other companies. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, but I, but I, what I want to do here, cause I don't want to go on a tangent about this. I just wanted to give my opinion. I do want to talk about a couple of companies that have come up with some innovative ideas for this industry. The first company is Funksack. Yeah, funny. It's a funny name, Funk Sack. Oh, get your mind moving. Uh, but yeah, you know, Garrett Fortune, he invented a product that is an odorless, resealable plastic bag, which is interesting. Uh, he owns a product that's called Odo No, which is an odor-proof bag for human and animal waste. So if you can imagine, if this bag can hold the smell of that and you don't smell anything, and cannabis is a smart move. This is a given. This is like a no-brainer to me. Uh, if this industry continues to grow or go down the road of legalization as it seems that it's going to be at some point, yeah, you're going to go to one of these, these dispensaries. You're going to have a whole bunch of different varieties as you do now. But they'll probably have them in little bags that you can just, you know, take them and go, that type of thing. It'll probably keep, uh, allow them to last longer because I assume that, that dries up after a while, so it'll allow them to last longer in an odorless bag. So you're not gonna, you know, smell that stuff. So they'll probably have it on shelves and racks and all that stuff. So could be interesting. I think it's gonna be a big winner at the end of the day in this industry. And that's one company that I came across. And there was another startup company that was actually giving certification or training for bud tenders. Yeah, you heard that right, bud. Tenders, they are bartenders for the cannabis dispensaries, and you know, look, the the, the company's called Potbotics, and they are based in New York City. And uh, what they're looking to do is create technology that will replace these butt tenders at some point. I really don't know what kind of technology. I'm, gonna, I'm assuming that it's going to be uh, information-based because part of their certification or training is these butt tenders being well-informed with the different types of cannabis that are at the dispensaries and what the uses are and so on and so forth. So I'm assuming that the technology is going to be that uh, so they, they may have a kiosk for patrons or things of that nature. So maybe there's, they'll be like, you know, maybe they'll have them in those, those, uh, those little, uh, funk sacks and you put the money in and they pop right out. Hey, who knows? Could, could happen. Kiosk. Good idea. Uh, the last startup company that I came across is based in San Diego. Uh, and I found this to be extremely interesting because I'm, I'm a techie nerd guy. And I'm always interested in the wave of new technology developments coming in any industry. The technological developments in any industry gets my attention. So anyhow, um, this company is called Herbalizer or Herbalizer. And they are, they, what they do, they created a small, sleek vaporizer with a heating system deal. And I guess it's kind of like an electric cigarette. But not, obviously not, right? Um, now, what caught my attention is that these aren't kids, Harvard kids, in a, in a dorm room creating this. These are actual rocket scientists, and I mean like bang, big bang theory types. And they took about three years to develop this. And these two guys may be at the forefront of the standard in the cannabis industry for usage. Now, Josh Young is the CEO and Bob Pratt is the CTO. Between these two guys, they developed um, advanced NASA technology, I mean crazy science, for stealth bombers and military programs. So I'm leaning uh, towards them getting this right. 
I really do. I really do see that uh, being the case. And the only thing that prevents this company from, you know, exploding at the seams, because I believe, from what I understand, they they're in line to do about two million in revenue this year. And the only thing that's preventing them from exploding is that this falls under drug paraphernalia, and there are laws in place to prevent you from marketing it. So they can't market it as a cannabis tool. They have to market it as something else, and people don't know what it is, so they're not going to buy it, you know. But they say about 90% of their customers use it for cannabis, but, uh, you know, I don't know what else they would use it for. Uh, but people do get innovative when they want to use uh, certain items for certain things. Anyhow, if the law changes, maybe this one will be one of the big winners in this space on the technology end. I guarantee you that other technology companies will come to the forefront. Now, I just want to groom groom everyone on this topic just a little bit and talk about a few of these companies because we will be having Matt Shotwell of the of Discovery Channel's uh, Weed Country on the show next week to discuss cannabis, the cannabis industry, get his views and you know talk about the show a little bit and also find out what else uh, he's up to and get some of the latest from Matt Shotwell. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break and uh, come back with Tiffany Brown, the star matchmaker, to talk about matchmaking and the dating industry. So don't leave. Stay right with us. This is Chef Gavin Murphy with your one-minute healthy cooking tip. A lot of people are more health conscious nowadays, especially when it comes to food. But did you know there are a lot of hidden calories and, of all things, salad dressing? They are chock full of added sugars. But don't fret, I've got you covered. Try this quick and delicious salad dressing recipe. Grab a small Tupperware container with a lid and add a quarter cup of balsamic vinegar, two tablespoons of whole grain or Dijon mustard, a teaspoon of organic honey, pinch of salt and pepper and three quarters of a cup of olive oil. Pop the lid on and give it a good old shake. This is spot on for a beautiful summer salad and will keep in the fridge for weeks. For more healthy cooking tips and info, Go to GavinMurphy.com. Money is pouring in at Resorts World Casino. Players gather around the clock at Baccarat, slot machines, and other electronic games. Last year, uh, we approached nearly $800 million in uh, gross gaming revenue. A stark contrast to the failing casinos of Atlantic City. Resorts Casino is the only legalized gambling site in New York City and is now the most successful racetrack casino in the world after opening just three years ago. It capitalizes on its location inside the densely populated New York City region. You walked in and right away you feel, you know, like you're at home. The casino's owner, Genting Group, is hoping to open two more casinos upstate, one in Orange County and one in Tuxedo. They are up against other big hitters like Caesars Entertainment, Hard Rock International, and Empire Resorts, who see growing opportunity away from traditional gambling destinations. Now that Philadelphia has casinos and the New York City area has casinos, it has cut off um, the traffic to Atlantic City. So, you know, Atlantic City is, is suffering, but these other casinos in general are doing very well. State officials will soon decide which casino operator they think can generate the most long-term tax revenue. Resorts Casino Chief Financial Officer Ryan Eller says they're not worried about the market becoming oversaturated. We feel that we can compete for a national and international business customer. Now that the gambling industry has more access to more people than ever before, some casinos are taking their chances for an even bigger payoff. Uh-huh. Yeah. Alright, welcome back to Money Never Sleeps And now, we know a lot of you out there, our listeners uh, You're married, you have significant others And you're happy as can be But, in the United States alone, there are over 51 million singles out there And approximately 41 million people Plus, singles have tried online dating or other dating sources. And this is part of the growth in the multi-billion dollar dating industry. Now, today we're bringing on a true expert in matchmaking. She understands business, she understands the industry, and she's extremely successful in what she does. 
So what I want to do, I want to bring uh, Tiffany Brown on the show. So uh, let's bring her on. <laughs> Tiffany, welcome to Money Never Sleeps. How are you? I am well, thank you. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. I want to thank you for making time to come on the show. I know you're busy, busy, and you don't even have time to breathe at times. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. <laughs> yeah. So let, let's talk about the let's talk about what you do first, and then we're, then we're going to talk about the dating industry because I think that you know this is something that's progressively increasing, and you have a lot of people you know using dating services services whether online or uh, or agencies like yourself. So tell us a little bit about what you do, and then let's go into the industry itself. Okay. Well, I am a personal matchmaker, and um, I basically I work with my clients hands-on into uh, um, running their uh, personal love life, pretty much. Um, I'm responsible for um, finding their match. Well, let me let me ask mm -hmm. you a question with what you do. I mean, there's a there's a difference between mm -hmm. people going online and doing the the dating deal and having a personal matchmaker. Now, to me, I think a personal matchmaker uh, would probably help, hold more significance because it's really hands-on. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and more than anything, someone who's, who's going to uh, hire a personal matchmaker is someone who is very busy, you know, uh, someone who has a lot of other, a, a, many other things that... Um, are happening in their life and they just kind of seem to put a love life on hold. So um, hiring someone like me is uh, kind of like um, hiring a personal trainer, but someone to help them out with their love life. Ah, yeah. And, you know, because, mm. you know, the online dating thing, that's like another job. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, you, you have to do yeah. all this stuff, and and then you and reaching out and going back and forth with people. It I mean, it takes a lot out of you. And if you're busy, if you if you have you run a business, you run a corporation, you're you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, or you know you you're just a busy person. Like even you're busy with what you're doing. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's a little difficult to get out there and make the time to dedicate it to finding that one person, even though you want that person to. Speak taking the time to do it is a little hard absolutely yes so I, and you know people that do i mean the dating um online dating is so overpopulated these days too i mean you get a pretty girl on there and she's been approached probably about 500 times that day yeah. so how, how do you so get, it does become quite a bit of a problem online yeah how, how do you even sift through things i mean again you know, just as for people at the time to do it, I mean, how do you sift through things on online dating? It's a little difficult. Uh, online dating is difficult, and not only, um, you know, just uh, going through um, the profiles is how which one to choose. I mean, there's so many to choose from um, on online dating. Um, you know, uh, people really have to do their research and figure out how they're going to do this. So, I mean, it's really time-consuming mm -hmm. on, uh, on online dating. So uh, that's why people hire a personal matchmaker, so they don't have to worry about those things. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, online dating, it, it is what it is. And, you know, I mean, you're talking <laughs> about the Internet and, you know, you have, and I'm just saying it because I can see this as being the case because I've heard many stories about this. You know, you have people on there that aren't who they say they are. You have scammers on there trying to take advantage of people that are looking for that, that person. So a lot of, you know, pitfalls can happen there. So you got to be careful in, in the online dating thing, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure there's um, <laughs> probably half of the profiles could be fake. I mean, you know, you just never know who you're going to meet. So, um, you know, if you are an online dater, I think the best thing that you can do is uh, Skype interviews and make sure that you meet people, um, you know, before beforehand or see what they look like or have them confirm themselves because, yeah, it is quite, um, it can be dangerous for sure. So, so it's a better situation if you're if you're dating someone or trying to date someone online to get to know them first before you actually you know physically get in front of them because mm -hmm. <laughs> things things happen. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. And I mean, um, you know, and not only that, some people, you know, may use a picture from 10 years ago, too. So, <laughs> you know, you just really want to make sure you know who you're talking to, because, um, you know, uh, it, it's a scary world sometimes, for sure. Yeah, you have somebody that puts a picture from 10 years ago, and you see them now, it's like, yeah, you know, you're about 100 pounds larger <laughs> yeah. than you were in that picture there. You know, and, and it happens for both men and women, you know, so now, how do you, how do you make life easier? Because I know you deal with a lot of affluent uh, people. So how do you make it easier for them? Oh, sorry, you're, um, it went really, really low. I, you're going to have to repeat that. Oh, see that that's this is technology. Oh. Um, okay. What, what I what I what I asked is, you deal with a lot of affluent people. So how do you make their how do you make things easier for them to actually find that special person and how difficult is it for you to do that? Uh for me to find a match, you mean for my client? Yeah, yeah. What, what what do you do how what do you do to make their life easier in in finding a match for them? Well, you know, um a lot of matchmakers work really differently. Um you know, some some they do blind dates, some they don't. I mean, when I work with my clients, I basically, you know, we're kind of a team. Mm -hmm. So I collaborate uh, with each one. Um, you know, I full out, uh, run a search for them, and I collaborate with them and meet with them once a week and go over who I found and uh, basically get them to choose. I mean, there has to be an attraction. Um, you know, you may find uh, the perfect person, but if you have no attraction, then what's the point of meeting them? So um, I do a lot of personal interviewing, um, and uh, I find out exactly what my client's looking for, and I go after that. And uh, once I once I round some ladies up, I bring them to the client, and uh, we go over them together. Okay, so and, we, you, uh, you, you, you interview you interview, but you interview the uh, the potentials, whether they be whether they're men or women. I do absolutely. Everyone has to be interviewed through me. Um, that comes through my agency. Okay, so you every single person that uh, is um, being set up needs to go through an interview, and um, we also do uh, criminal record checks and and background checks just to make sure that the person is who they say they are. Mm -hmm. um, ID checks, all this sort of thing. Um, you know, my clients are very important to me, so I want to make sure that um, I'm uh, setting them up with someone uh, who says that who um, you know uh, who they are, basically who they say they are. Right. Well, I mean, again, because you deal with a lot of affluent people, you know, they depend on you to for for discretion, and also to make sure whoever you're bringing to the table is genuine, so that if they wanted to move forward, that they don't they don't need that fear that there's going to be an issue. Absolutely. I mean, I try my best for sure. Um, you know, you can't make people stay together, but I mean, you know, you, when you interview someone and you, you know, you, you align everything, um, together with needs and, and stuff like this, I mean, it's the, it's the best way possible, really. Well, I mean, you mm -hmm. do that, you're doing your job and, and you're bringing the situations yes. to the table. You know, and again, we, as we spoke about earlier, you know, with the online dating regimen and what people need to do, you know, base what you're doing, you're making it so um, turnkey for your clients that all they do is you interview them, they hire you, you go get everything for them, and you just bring it to the table. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you, um, you show them videos and stuff? Um, you know, not a lot of people do videos. I mean, I keep it, I do the personal interview. I can, I interview on Skype. Um, you know, I can, I can make a pretty good uh, judgment call um, ID check them. And, you know, for the most part, I believe any single person that is going to um, participate with a matchmaker is very serious about a serious relationship. Um, you know, typical people, you know, we don't get a lot of people who uh, um, just want to kind of date. Everyone that comes to me is looking for something very serious. So. They're looking for a relationship. It's not about, hey, you know, we're going to be we're going to be yeah. a playboy or a playgirl or, or or whatever uh uh cougar or schmooger whatever whatever they have out there you know they they're looking for someone to actually build a life with absolutely absolutely i mean mm -hmm. you know uh people are busy people are so busy these days i mean you know it, it's just how badly do you 
do you want to meet someone and, and you want to change things in your life? And, you know, um, it's really great for people with a busy life. And, and you know, they, they actually feel very good and comfortable um, with my approach. So working, working, with, worth, working with my clients really helps. You know, I, I don't put everything in, you know, I don't let everyone just trust me, you know. Mm-hmm. Let's work together and we'll work it out and, um, and uh, let, them, let the client actually uh, make, make the decisions and not just me, you know. Right. But you're selective with your client as well, with, with the clients you Absolutely. bring on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have to be very selective. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. What's the criteria for someone that wanted to use your service? Um, uh, you know, I think for, for the most part is um, the only thing that I really, really ask of people is, you know, um, I only go for people. I want to get marriages. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, I only want people who are very serious about a serious relationship and, and um, you know, that are willing to work with me and, um, you know, I, d- I don't really want to, you know, uh, turn people down or, or things like this, but I'm definitely, if, um, um, try to work as honest as I can, you know, and if I can't find that match, I will definitely reach out to other matchmakers, um, or, or anyone else and, and to see if they, if, if they can find one also. So, you know, I never want to leave anyone, uh, feeling unhappy or, you know, I want to make sure that basically they know exactly what I'm doing. So, I mean, um, you know, uh, for the most part, it's just really responsible adults. And, but they have to be serious that they're trying to find someone, that they're not just utilizing you to go from, from girl or guy to girl, you know, whatever, whatever they're doing. Let's say if it's a guy from girl to girl to girl to girl, you know. And then, yeah. and, and then I would also think that <laughs> any of your clients, both you know, men and women, that they have to be realistic about what type of person they want to be with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are things we find out a little bit later. Mm -hmm. You know, I let, um, I I, I take notes, um, but see, I do do a feedback system. So, you know, I do get to know my clients really well if it doesn't work out right away. So, you know, um, over over a little bit of time, like by date three, I'm starting to see signals of, you know, why people aren't staying together. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, people don't realize that that they're um, having certain issues, um, usually until about date Three, and then we can really look at you know uh, what's keeping them keeping them behind or keeping them from uh, from uh, relationships. So we have to address certain issues along the way, also. Okay, well that that's that's definitely you know that's important because if you if you're monitoring their progress you know, from just from a, 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 the first match, it'll give you a good idea of of what they're lacking and what maybe they need to change in order to find that right person. Absolutely. And those are the things I'm, I'm not making those up. I mean, you know, uh, these are, these, these are the things that are happening. So, uh, you know, if uh, the third lady comes back and she's like, okay, well, you know, I don't really like this guy because he keeps talking about his ex ex wife. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's really annoying. You know, by the third time that this happens, I'm able to go to the client and say, listen, you know what? This isn't working for you. You're talking about your ex-wife. No one wants to hear it. The ladies don't like it. Mm. So, I mean, it, it becomes a time where you have to kind of confront things also, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it is helpful. I mean, people don't know, people don't know until they're faced, um, a situation, you know, they don't know what they're doing wrong, right. uh, until they, uh, kind of look at it in the face. So. Well, yeah, because, they, I mean, if they're with someone and they're doing that, the person may say that to them and they're not going to believe it because, you know, it's their ego. No, I didn't do that. I, this yeah. is how, this is how I am. Believe it. You know, so but you, you kind of become like a pseudo psychologist at times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I do deal with like in cases uh, people need uh, extra coaching and stuff like this. I mean, I have some amazing coaches I can work with, work with clients. You know, a lot of clients, they don't want to do this sort of thing, but, and they want to just do straight matchmaking, but you know, it does really come in handy when, um, when you're faced with certain situations. Okay. Well, what kind of coaches do you have that, you know, the client came to you that they, they, you know, if they needed it, that they would expect? Um, you know, I have some really amazing coaches. Uh, w- one of my um, longtime friends, actually, she works with me, and you know, she's uh, she's she's got a background in social work. And you know, I have uh, Susan Winter, who is um, you know, she deals with um, uh, she writes books on uh, younger men, older women, 
um, you know, I deal with that quite often. You know, a lot of, of uh, men, they really like younger women. You know, mm-hmm. Susan Winters, she's been on every talk show. She's been on Oprah three times. You know, she's amazing. Um, you know, she can help um, people understand this these things and, and, and why they feel this way. And, you know, a lot of the times it's absolutely perfectly fine. You know, we may not all um, agree with each other, but, you know, um, on different views, but having having the tools there to be able to help people with those type of situations is, is really great. Uh, I, I've also just, um, I'm doing some work with um, uh, Catapult mm-hmm. uh, Entertainment also, and um, her name is Dr. Zoe. She's with uh, the Today Show, and, you know, she is absolutely amazing also, and she's uh, she's an amazing coach. I'm actually doing her uh, her life coach course and uh, we're doing some work together also so you know coaches they're there and um, you know I have some of the best coaches that you could possibly have so uh, I'm really happy with this so you know if someone does have a problem and they need that extra help the help is there and uh, I really uh, it's a really good thing to have so you know coaching and um, matchmaking do go hand in hand. Yeah, well, I mean, look. That's how it kind of goes. But, you know, I look at it, if you're a professional athlete, you have a coach, you know, because you don't want to think about it, you just want to do it. And they'll tell you what you're doing wrong, you're going to listen to them because they know what they're talking about. So if you have someone, a client, that, you know, is doing something wrong and they haven't found someone to stay with all this time, then obviously there's something wrong. So, you know, you kind of try to pinpoint it, tweak it, but you have the tools in your tool chest to actually make everything happen and hopefully, you know, get them linked up with someone for the long haul. Yes. Yes, and ultimately, I mean, we just we just want a happy story, you know. I don't I don't want to be in the business of, uh, you know, just uh, making people unhappy, you know, um, just you know, giving giving uh, the clients what they need, you know. If they need extra help, some may may shy away from the coaching, and that's fine. They don't they don't have to do that, you know. Um, it, it's really up to up to uh, the individual. All right, and everything's on a case by case, like anything else, because not one person is like the next. Absolutely. Everybody is so different, you know. Everyone's going to have a different different search. Everybody's going to have a different plan. Yeah, and, and the one thing, for the guys that are looking for the younger girls and the women that are looking for the younger guys, just understand one thing. At some point in time, you're going to have to have a conversation, and they may not mm-hmm. know what you're talking about because they weren't born then. So think mm-hmm. about it. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Not that there's, there's anything wrong with it because you have, what do they call it, uh, May, November romances or whatever they are, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, you, you have those situations that actually work, but I think that people have to, in my opinion, you have to be a little more realistic with what your needs are and what your wants are and what your yeah. true outlook is going to be for yourself and what you want to do in your life. Yeah, I mean, you could tweak that as you go as well, you know. I mean, some people may um, start out with saying, this is what I want and this is what I want, and, you know, uh, maybe that doesn't work out so well. So, like, you know, maybe we need to start some new wants and start, uh, you know, uh, looking at things in a, in a different perspective also, you know. Just as long as you're being proactive and, you know, you're 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 setting yourself up you know, you, you know what you want, and you mm-hmm. want to go after it. I mean, changing changing views is really just something you learn along the way. Yeah, I, I would I would mm-hmm. think so because you begin to learn more about you, and that's when your coaches kind of come into play, and your your experience and your background. You know, with with all the people that you've helped and you have helped match uh, up over the years, it gives you a lot mm-hmm. of insight. So you kind of, when something happens, it's not you're not thinking about it. You already know the signs, so you're able to oh, go yeah. in there and say, "Hey, we got to do something here." Yeah. And, you know, um, they're writing their own story here. I'm just documenting it. <laughs> yeah, but, but it helps so, other I people. Mean, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the type of person that says, okay, my way is right. Um, I'm just the type of person that's going to let the client um, discover themselves and, you know, work it out along the way there. So, I mean, I mean unless it's something, of course, that needs to be addressed right away, you know, yeah. um, then I will absolutely do that if it's if it's out there but you know anybody that's really going to come to a matchmaker they're they're serious i mean for the most part i don't get uh, players that are just there to you know waste my time yeah. you know um 
people that hire a matchmaker, they know what they want. They they want a relationship and a serious one. So. And, and that's the key thing is wanting the relationship. Now, what your particulars are in the middle, you know, you may think that you know what you want, but if you knew what you wanted, you would have got it already. So obviously what, what they're doing is not, they don't know what they want. They have to kind of understand what they want. If yeah. That... Yeah, they do need to understand it. But a lot of times, too, it's, you know, people aren't just, she's just not meeting, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could be the most amazing person and, you know, have everything going for you. You know, but the problem is you have all these great things going for you, but guess what? You're just not in meeting the right people. Mm-hmm. So hiring me, um, I'm able to, to be able to look places that, that a normal person wouldn't mm-hmm. look, you know, mm-hmm. and, and introduce them to people that they probably would never met. Right. So, and, and I just want to add this that, yeah, I just want to add this because, you know, I, I just made some comments. You know, you do have people out there that are genuinely looking for someone. And, you know, I mean, look, you, you look at a, a George Clooney type, okay? Mm-hmm. And he's going to find someone and he was going to go and, you know, well, obviously he did it on his own. He's married. But, you know, if he mm-hmm. was, if someone like that was out there trying to find someone, you know, you'll have a lot of people interested in you and then for you to sift through all of that it's work and it can be tiring so having you oh. makes that an easier deal um sorry make it an easier deal for for, for them scouting? for yeah. them for them because you know going oh. uh going through the dating process when you're when you're 20 is one thing but when you're 40 mm-hmm. and you're you're getting up there it's it's it becomes work Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is work. I mean, I know this because I'm the one doing all the searching. You know, I know exactly how hard it is. And, um, you know, um, I, really, it's it's as long as, as you keep trying. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like anything in life. You know, you put focus on something that you want to change and, and you work towards that goal. It, it's going to happen. You know, um, it, so anyone that really... Um, you know, they they want to. You know, they they really want a relationship. Well, it, it's all about having, a, for one, a, a good attitude. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if you're gonna, you know, oh, this isn't gonna happen for me, and this isn't gonna happen for me. You know, that you're just gonna keep getting that is this isn't gonna happen for you because you tell the universe that, and that's exactly what you get. So really, just um, you know, you gotta really have a positive, um, a positive uh, mind frame and. And um, everything will fall in its place. <laughs> okay. And then you're holding their hand through it, so it actually just yeah. makes things work a little smoother, a lot smoother. A lot smoother, well, I mean, most definitely. And being able to have good communication with me is really um, a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, um, because, you know, people, people, I mean, this is a very sensitive topic because, you know, you're dealing with people's hearts. So, um you know, just just having someone in your life that that's able to help you with that goal is is kind of like uh, something that uh, you you'd really like. That a little bit different with me also is having uh, that relationship with my clients. You know, uh, um, a lot of other matchmakers they just strictly, um, you know, they strictly match and they don't really get it. It's, some of them don't get on the personal side or they'll do blind dating and this and that. I really just work with work with my clients and and work out work out their goals and plans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, blind dating and, and actively search. I mean, that's exactly what I do. I mean, yeah. search. Yeah, blind and dating I is work. Many many hours doing this. <laughs> well, and and that's why that's why I do say that anyone that needed a true matchmaker that they sh- they should uh, reach out to you, especially you know in Canada. But you do stuff all over the place. So, I do, you know. and I, cause, because I have. So many connections, you know. Yeah. Um, social media is a really big deal for me. I mean, I, I have probably about 35,000 uh, followers. And, you know, being able to have good connections online is very, very beneficial. You know, putting yourself out into those groups. I mean, I could not physically be able to do that, um, you know, in out on the, uh, you know, just walking around. I mean, you know, I'm in tons of groups. I have networking groups all over. And and that that's a key thing, and that gets you out there so more people know. But I, I I will say that anyone that wanted a matchmaker, you know, you need to get in touch with Tiffany Brown. She knows what she's talking about. She knows, you know, what's what works and what doesn't, and it's going to save you a lot of pain. 
And I want to save you pain here. Save you the pain of going <laughs> through the dating regimen and the and the non and the stuff. It's just just work, man. It's just work and it's yeah. work that, that that you don't want to do. But you know, Tiffany, why don't you you know, give uh, your website information, your social media information, so that listeners, if they're interested, they can uh, reach out to you. Okay, great. Um, my website is www.affinityconnections, that's with an S, dot com. And uh, you can find me on Facebook um, at Affinity Connections. And on Twitter, I am Tiffany Brown. Okay. I'm also on Google+, Pinterest, I'm... LinkedIn, um, you can look me up. There you go. All right, and I do. Yeah. I, I and many do, more too, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, well, you got a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there. But I do say that anyone that was looking for a matchmaker, a real, really good one, you know, Tiffany Brown is someone you want to look into and check her out. Yeah. Go to the website. Go check her out on, on social media because she is the matchmaker. Oh, for you. Thank you so much, no, Lou. Thank, thank you, Tiffany, and thank you for coming on the show. And uh, we're gonna have you on again because I know this whole topic is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're just scratching the surface here with stuff. Uh, but uh, for our listeners, I want you to stick with us. We're gonna be right back on Money Never Sleeps after this short break. Your platform for success, chosen by industry leaders worldwide. Curve Street, advanced real estate technology. Hi, my name is Peter May of London Central Properties, and we're based in Cavendish Square, which is close to Regent's Park. The majority of my work experience has been in sales, in particular the hotel and hospitality industry, both in the UK and overseas. London Central Properties is an established company with a global presence and a high reputation for service and discretion. We specialize in the sale of high value, off-market apartments, houses, hotels and investments. We have recently opened a new division specializing in the provision of service departments which cover the full spectrum from budget to exclusive. These apartments are suitable for both leisure and corporate clients and are located in the key areas of London, including Mayfair, Knightsbridge, Kensington and Bayswater. For further information, please refer to our website, which is www.londoncentralproperties.com. We have now established an exclusive partnership with the host of Money Never Sleeps, Mr. Louis Velasquez. Uh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh. All right, welcome back to Money Never Sleeps, and I want to talk about HBO for a minute. Woo, man, they're doing some amazing stuff. Time Warner just floored the digital distribution arena. And through Netflix in a Hail Mary situation, look, HBO, what they did, they announced that they're going to have their own on-demand distribution for those in the world that do not subscribe to HBO on, on cable or satellite. This is a true game changer. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. Them, I don't know why they didn't do it sooner, but them doing it is a big thing. And let me, for those that aren't, that don't know this, but HBO is, no doubt, HBO is the original cable channel before there was cable. All you had was an antenna on your roof and you had a little box by your TV and that was HBO. And they have content upon content upon content and now the original content that they produce is in such high demand. Okay, Sopranos, this, that, Boardwalk Empire, oh my God, I mean it's insane. And it's in high demand and if they made a deal with Netflix, it would have sealed the deal for Netflix's future. It would have put, it would have kept them on the map for a long time. But that's not the case anymore. And there, I mean, there's shakiness going on here. And this is, again, true game changer, no doubt. Uh, you have Amazon that's been chomping on Netflix's heels 
for a bit. They've been producing their own original content, trying to do something Netflix-ish, kind of. And now with HBO coming on the scene with this, I really think that the high-flying days of Netflix, you know, may be all but over. They just got slammed to the tune of about 20 25%, maybe even 30% over the past, you know, couple of days last week. Uh, I believe that's the case. So I know it, it dropped. I don't know. The, I'm not sure about the percentage. Uh, and I think as the investing community, the investment community, uh, begin to understand what is really happening here, they're going to see that Time Warner just raised a bar. You know, they puffed out their chest and they're getting, they're going to be a leader in the on demand digital arena. An arena that Netflix all but dominated for so many years. Now, I, now, if you remember, uh, Time Warner was on the, uh, was in play. You had other cable companies that wanted to buy them. Time Warner said, pay us, you know, this is what we're worth. They didn't think so. I guarantee you, I guarantee you they're thinking back saying, wow, we should have made that deal. And guess what, guys? You should have, you should have pulled the trigger and paid them what they want. You should have pulled a Google and just pay up and get it done because now they're going to get it done themselves. And I'm not going to venture on stock prices. That's not what I do here. I share my views and my opinions. These are my views and my opinions. And you should never solely depend on the views of opinion or opinions of one person. You know, do your due diligence and, uh, you know, make, you know, form your own informed uh, opinions and, and, and you make your own informed decisions. Uh, just for, um, just, just for full disclosure, I do not own a position of Time Warner nor Netflix. So I have no, Nothing to gain or lose from this. Uh, but I do see the writing on the wall. Any hope of Google or Amazon gobbling up Time Warner may be all but over. And Time Warner may or may not spin out uh, HBO as his own public company. I don't know. I have to think that with this in hand that they're going to do what they should have done a while ago. And with HBO and with Time Warner's library, my God, I mean, Warner Brothers, everything else, they're going to have no shortage of content to distribute or to have on their on their own network. And this is what, this this is funny, you know, Blockbuster and Hollywood Video, especially Blockbuster, they had this in their hands. They laughed at Netflix. Well, who's laughing now? You know, HBO, you know, they, they, they're coming, they're coming to play. Okay. Blockbuster, Hollywood video, they didn't have the vision. There were no visionaries there. Okay. You need to be, you need to be a forward thinker to, to be ahead of the curve. And I'm saying this now on this show that whoever, whoever pulled the trigger on this decision is the right person to lead the evolution of Time Warner. This is an evolution of Time Warner. Going from old guard to new guard, and this is what they need to do. And they started with HBO. And I'm telling you guys, if you're smart, get your board together, put these people together. And whoever made this decision and made this happen, this is the, this is the person you want at the helm of Time Warner. All right. Now, I want to touch on commercial real estate for a bit. Um, foreign buyers, they've been gobbling up commercial assets to the tune of $85.4 billion in the first half of 2014. Now, that's compared to about $76.7 billion in the first half of 2013, which, of course, is last year. And these numbers are just coming out, so I'm able to share them so now we can give comparisons. And recently... Um, you know, they were able to get a little more specific on these numbers. And this is really, 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 really interesting. I find that interesting anyway. Um, almost half of those foreign investments that happened this year went right into office real estate, into the office real estate market, which is, which has been booming, you know, and that, that'll, if you, you build office space and you build commercial space, you're going to have jobs there. And, and I, and I said that last week and I'll say, I'll say it this week, I'll say it next week and a week after. You create somewhere for, um, for business to grow and they'll grow and they'll come. So the office market is actually hot. 
And this is, you know, the investors that are coming in are not just coming from China. People think that, oh, Chinese money is coming. It's coming from China, 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 China. No, that's not the, these are, these, these are not the only big players. You have other big players involved and they're, they're, they're coming in. And uh, you have China, of course, you have Russia and you have Canada. And there are fewer, you, you even have Australia coming in. It's, it's incredible. Uh, I mean, these, these are the, these are the countries that didn't get slammed by the mortgage debacle. So they're taking advantage of everything that's happening because we put band-aids and everything, you know, but all this stuff is coming home to roost as the market begins to heal and as these things begin to heal. You know, what winds up happening is that these people have been living in their, their homes, you know, and they're living in these areas, you know, that, they haven't even paid their mortgage for X amount of time because that's how the system's set up to allow that to happen. All this stuff's, you know, going to come, it's going to unwind piece by piece, and you're going to have uh, a lot of investors coming in to take advantage of that. And this is on, you know, again, it's on a residential, but more so on a commercial end because I'm looking at things from a commercial point of view. All right, so, uh, you know... And that, that, that this is what's happening. So anyway, you have these these countries in buying mode, companies from these countries in buying mode. Not the countries themselves, but people and investors from these countries in buying mode. And they've been battling they've been battling over trophy properties. You know, now you have the battle for uh, you know for other, you know these big properties in New York. You know, you have a lot of development properties happening. They're developing condos, office buildings, towers, strip malls, and all this stuff's happening. And basically, any major asset in in any major market, I mean, there's a lot of action going on. So it's a great time to be in the commercial real estate arena. And now I want to give you a little breakdown for the commercial acquisitions uh, that have been happening in, in the major markets in the first half of 2014, just to give you a better idea of what is happening um, in, in that arena, because it does impact you on a lot of levels. It impacts everyone on a lot of levels. All right. So anyway, New York City, of course, was on top of the, the buy list to the tune of $9.4 billion the first half of this year. If the hotels like the Waldorf and a few others that are on the, that are on the, uh, they're in play. Uh, but hotels like the Waldorf Astoria, if they get completed this year along with a few others, then those numbers, they're gonna escalate, uh, for the second half of 2014 for New York. Uh, the second major market getting chomped up is Los Angeles, LA. Yep. A lot of stuff going on over there on the commercial end. Uh, that to the tune of $4.6 billion in transactional sales. And then you have $3 billion in transactional sales that are spread between Boston, Washington, and then the rest, you pretty much widespread Detroit and, you know, even Boise, Idaho, whatever, you know, other, other developing markets, you know, so it's spread out throughout them, throughout those uh, areas. Now, this is interesting. You're probably not thinking about this. Uh, one of the big players coming in, uh, you have a lot of new blood coming in from Latin America. Yep. Investors from Latin America, what they're doing, they're coming to play in a major way. And this is, this is the transition. And you're going to see a lot of this over the next, you know, couple of years. Uh, they're looking for a home to stash their cash and assets that will appreciate. And, and this is what's happening here. You know, these foreign investors are known as safety capital bidders. And as they're buying these properties and repositioning them, the vacancy levels are decreasing broad base across all markets. And, and it makes sense. You buy a building, you buy a property, you fix it up, people will come. Bottom line, you don't buy a property and leave it as such and expect to get the same results. It's like, you know, doing the same thing day after day, expecting something different to happen. It doesn't work that way. You reposition it, you fix it up, your vacancy levels will drop, your occupancy levels will increase, and there you go, you're going on to your next investment property. And New York City alone, lease rates uh, in an area, let's say like, uh, let me give you an example, like the Garmick District, right? Uh, they've risen over the past three years from an average rate of the high 20s, let's say 27, 28, 29 dollars a rentable square foot to the low 30s, let's say 30, anywhere from 30 to 33 dollars a rentable square foot. Now, today, well, now you're looking at, you know, the, uh, the low to mid 40s and up. If you're looking at a retail, uh, 
uh, ground level retail uh, space, guaranteed you're 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 somewhere in the range of seventy to one hundred and ten dollars a rentable square foot. So it's a it's a supply and demand story. The inventory is decreasing, and those numbers I just gave are for the garment district only, not for all of New York. You know, because you go to some some areas, you go to Soho, you know, you'll have rates that'll be, you know, forget about it. I'm talking about office rates. I mean, you can go and you you'll wind up spending, you know, sixty, seventy, eighty dollars a rentable square foot uh, in some buildings. But uh, anyway. You have the inventory decreasing, buildings are being repositioned, and tenants are flocking to the doors of vacant office space. And the same is holding true for Los Angeles, Boston, and other areas. And you're going to see that continuing to happen because these investors are coming in. They're not coming in to just say, hey, I'm going to hold on to the property. They, they, want to, they want to make a profit, of course. They definitely want to make a profit. It's a little different than when you're buying, when you have uh, foreign investors coming in buying uh you know four or five uh condos or buying a condo somewhere as a vacation home and that condo stay vacant for you know 10 months out of the year you know this this is a this is a far cry from that you know these are real numbers and because the, when you when you talk commercial real estate you're talking about building and you're talking about creating jobs because businesses go there so it's it's night and day that this is not uh this is just night and day all right uh one last thing in the commercial real estate arena that I want to touch on is technology tracking you know and, and and things like that you know the tech player is coming forward with tracking and measuring technology across all markets well they will be the recipient of an influx of business i I'm saying that now. You know, I say it because that's the way it's going to be. As I said, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a techie nerd type, and when it comes to technology, I'm interested in what's going on. In the commercial real estate arena, you know, technology is going to become a key component. As you have more foreign investors that are looking for good situations to plug the money into, you know, and you have commercial real estate professionals that are looking for tools to allow them to better service their clients. They serve, they provide better service, more informative service, they will get more business. They get more business, they make more money, so it makes sense to them. You know, they haven't even scratched the surface of all this. And big data will be a big thing in 2015, that is for sure. So, you know, uh, if you're in technology, you may want to look at the commercial real estate arena because it's going to be it's going to be a big boom. Uh, and I think 2015 is going to be very interesting. You're going to have those special companies that are going to come into play, and it's going to be uh, yeah, it's going to be beyond interesting. Okay, on that note. We are going to take a short break, and we're going to come back on the show with Hug Wrap's founder, Brenda Jones, and we're going to talk about what she's doing and you know, let her tell her story a little bit on Money Never Sleeps. Look, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You know, we want we want to hear what she has to say, and I think that you're going to really uh, you're going to really adhere what she, to, to what she's doing. So we're going to be back on Money Never Sleeps right after this quick break. So stay with us. Your platform for success. Chosen by industry leaders worldwide. Curve Street. Advanced real estate technology. Hi, everyone. John and Pete Nigerian here at the NASDAQ with some news you do not want to miss. As option floor traders, CNBC contributors, and co-founders of OptionMonster.com, people always want to know our secrets for trading the options. So we wrote an entire book on it. And today, to celebrate the book launch, we're giving away a limited number of these books for free. All you have to do is cover shipping and handling. Learn how you can use options like we do to make more income with less capital. To reduce your investment risks. And to make money regardless of which way the market's moving. It's all right here in this book, and today we're giving it away to you for free. Equity options today are hailed as one of the most successful financial products to be introduced in modern times. You have to learn to profit from them. This one book could dramatically increase your investment returns. And today it's free. So pick up that phone and call now. Call 1-800-961-1923 for your free book. That's 1-800-961-1923. Call now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
All right, welcome back to Money Never Sleeps. And on this show, we make it a point to highlight some good people making a difference in the world. And today, it's a pleasure to have one of those people with us. Brenda Jones is a breast cancer survivor, and she is the founder and designer of Hug Wraps. It's a hospital gown alternative for cancer patients to wear. And you know what? As opposed to me going further into it, let's bring Brenda on the show. Brenda, welcome to the show. Hi, Lewis. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, thanks for coming on. You're doing some amazing things out there. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm just trying to do my part to to give back to some other cancer patients going through difficult times like I did. All right, well, why don't you tell us about it so our listeners uh, can get a good idea of what Hugs Wraps, uh, what what it's about, and actually how you started this whole deal. Um, I actually started uh, Hug Wraps when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in um, October of '08. And by the time I reached daily radiation treatments in January of 09, I had become the angriest cancer patient there was. And my first day of radiation was not my best day when the nurse just looked at me and pointed to the dressing room and said, go on in there and put on a hospital gown. You're going to be wearing them for the next seven weeks. And I opened up the door of the dressing room and saw these stacks of hideous, itchy, thin hospital gowns, and I lost it. And I thought, you know what? I can't control cancer, but I can control what I wear. So that quickly in my head popped in an image, an idea of exactly what I wanted to make for myself Mm -hmm. that would replace having to wear that hospital gown. And that's exactly what I did. I I had no idea how to sew. Um, A friend taught me how to sew. And we came up with the the ideal pattern for what I wanted to design and make in a hug wrap. And that's exactly what we did. So now with with these hug wraps, you actually sew these yourself? Yes, I do. They're they're custom made by me for every patient. And, you know, really when I designed hug wraps, it really was just for my own comfort. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that another patient would find the comfort and dignity in a hug wrap that I did. And it wasn't until I designed, uh, you know, and made my first, it's really a kimono style wrap that opens in the front, ties in the belt, or ties with a belt. Mm -hmm. And it's made of flannel material because I, I was freezing in the hospital. And I wanted to choose bright, loud, fun colors because, you know, in my thought, I wanted to wear something louder than cancer. And okay. when I made this hug wrap, um, I really, again, didn't think anyone else would have an interest. And the first time I wore it to the hospital and took off my coat, I'd already, you know, had it on because I didn't want to have to change into anything else. And when I took off my coat, you know, there were stares and, you know, questions and, and people saying, where did you get that? What is that? And, you know, it, there was one patient there that, you know, had radiation at the same time I did, and her name was Millie. And Millie said, oh, my goodness, where did you buy that? I want one. And so I said, well, gee, Millie, I made it myself. I'll make one for you if you like. And that's what I started doing. It just went from one patient to another. And when I realized more patients were interested in, again, getting some comfort and dignity back that a hospital gown takes away from you. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, continued making it. I'm, I'm well over 1,200 by now, and I turned Hug Wraps into a 501c3 nonprofit. Wow. Wow. And, I mean, this is you sewing these things yourself. It's not like you have a big team of people doing this. You're doing it yourself. Yes, I started making them right here in my home. And, you know, thinking I would only make a couple for some patients, but then it just blossoms into, you know, uh, more people requesting them. So besides making them for breast cancer patients, I began making them for patients with all types of cancer. Mm -hmm. Give them a little, uh, I guess, a little enjoyment while they're there, you know, because, I mean, you're going through radiation, you're in the hospital. It's, It's a morbid situation as it is. 
That's correct, Lewis. You know, it's it's amazing how really just a um, a simple piece of material can make a patient feel better about themselves, you know, because it almost, to me, it made me seem like, you know, I was telling the hospital I matter, mm-hmm. that, you know, I you're not going to provide the, the comfort and dignity, so I'll do it myself. And, mm-hmm. you know, in this just bright, fun um, garment that I started making, and when other patients realized that it was made from one cancer patient for another, they realized I know what they've been through because I've been through that. So there's a number of levels that people find comfort in hug wraps. And um, it's really been, you know, something that has been a source of strength for them. Mm-hmm. And you, as well as I know, that if you give anyone just a little spark of hope or strength, they can take it and run, Lewis. Yeah, you know, you bring, you're bringing humanity into the equation where when you're in a hospital, you know, some people, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting when you put on a gown or you're in that environment, it takes, it takes the wind away from you. It, it, it really can, you know, cause it puts you in that state of mind. So you're actually changing that game a little bit for people that just may need that extra boost. Yes, that's exactly what I'm hoping to do, Lois, is to, um, you know, just, just give a patient, you know, something that says, again, I matter. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, you're not just that 930 appointment. You're not just another file. You're not just another cancer statistic. Mm-hmm. You're someone's, you know, friend, sister, mother, aunt, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and you deserve, you know, the, the dignity back that a hug wrap, I think, can give you during a very, very difficult time. Cancer is hard enough. Um, and lonely enough because one of the things that uh, I've always said, you know, when you're in cancer treatments, when you go through radiation, some people don't have the, the wonderful support system and family and friends behind them. And I know for me, when I went into that radiation, you know, I had someone go with me, but, you know, once I had to go into that radiation, uh, you know, and lay down and, and, you know, have that treatment, you're all by yourself. You're, you know, all the technicians, everybody leave. You're in there by yourself. But I always say to patients that, you know, as lonely as that can be, when you have that hug wrap and you can wear that during those treatments, you don't have to take it off, that, you know, I'm right there with you. You know, it, it's just, you know, one added um, level of comfort to know that, you know, there's someone wrapping you in a nice warm hug. That you're not alone. It's saying that you're not alone, no no matter where you are, what you're doing, you're not alone. And that's a good feeling. Yes, that, you know, and that someone, you know, has thought enough that, you know, and made this garment and, you know, spent the time because it takes me a couple hours to make each one. Mm -hmm. And I make them specifically for each patient. When I get a request for a hug wrap, I also ask for the patient's, like, three favorite colors and maybe a favorite pattern. And I try to match up the material so that it's also something that will put a smile on the face of, you know, someone very frightened. All right. Well, I mean, I think you're doing a fantastic thing, Brenda. And that, you know, and this, and this is a special month too, isn't it? Yes. You know, I, I think, you know, all of us, you know, there's always something we can do for someone else. And I think that, you know, when I was very, very angry, you know, during my radiation treatments, one of the things I realized is when I started making hug wraps, I took the focus off me being that cancer patient, and I was now able to focus on helping someone else. Mm-hmm. So by my sewing, it actually was a form of therapy that was most welcome because really every time I sat down at that sewing machine, a little bit of my anger was being released as well. So it was a comfort to me uh, to be able to help the other cancer patients. And there's nothing better than helping someone else. And my favorite motto is on my refrigerator and on my computer, and it's simply be the answer to someone else's prayers. And that's what I'm hoping to do with Hug Wraps. I mean, you, again, I think you're doing something fantastic. And why don't you share with our listeners, you know, the process. Uh, someone's in the hospital. They, uh, they're diagnosed with cancer. They're going through radiation. They have to go through their ba- the battery of test and everything else. You know, how... What what process do they have to uh, go through in order to get a hug wrap? You can simply um, go to my website, which is hugwraps.org, and take a look around, and you can see what a hug wrap looks like. 
And I also offer them in two different lengths for women with, well, or men too. Lewis, men get breast cancer. Yeah. Um, you know, because I don't specifically make these for women. I make them for men as well. Well, it's, to, it's, it's, to, it's to anyone. It's with it's for anyone with cancer, or it can be any any ailment. If you're in the hospital for a long stay, you know this. Absolutely. Can, I mean, this can work for you. That's, yep, that's true. I I've made them for patients in nursing homes and um, patients in hospice, um, you know, MS patients, whatever. You know, any time that um, you know I can provide comfort, that's what a hug wrap can do. And a lot of people say, "Oh, I I know someone going through cancer, but I don't know what to do for them." And a lot of times, hug wraps is the perfect answer. As opposed and to flowers so, you know, and cards them, and everything, you know, give them something right. that, that can stay with them and be useful every day. Right. And a lot of times people will say, you know, this is for my sister and she lives in California. You know, I can't be there, but at least I can hug her through this. Mm-hmm. And she knows I you know, was thinking of her. And every time she puts it on, she'll know, she'll think of me that I'm supporting her. And let me ask you a question with, with the hug wraps, just as a thought in my mind. Now, with the patterns, with the material, you know, if someone wanted to, let's say, make a hug wrap with, uh, I don't know, a picture of their, their, of, of their dog or their family on there, would they be able to get a material that is imprinted like that? I can usually... Um you know, match up because of, there's so much a variety of fabric out there. Mm-hmm. You know, and people will say, oh, you know, my, uh, just recently someone was a, a person who runs a rescue and she specializes in rescuing, uh, dachshunds. And someone, you know, had called and said, oh, you know, I, I want to hug wrap for this lady. Do you have anything in dachshund material? And it just so happened I did. Okay. So I try to match it up that way. You know, somebody will say, oh, you know, that, um, oh, uh, my friend is like a world traveler. So I have this wonderful material that I found that, you know, had all of these travel logo things on. It was great. And right. I and I try to match up as best I can. Now, for the men, I just made one for someone who was an avid fisherman. Okay. And I found the perfect material with fishing lore. It was it's, you know, kind of, you know, a fun challenge to, you know, match up with what a patient would like. And these, the hug wraps are machine washable, right? Just like uh, any other garment. That's correct. These are, um, it, you can just put them in the wash. They're, they're bright colors, but they're flannel, so they're easily washed, and then you tumble dry and hang them up. And, and you can, um, you can, and they're perfect it. and ready to go. Yeah. And you know what else? One of the things I also do for a hug wrap is mm-hmm. that, um, uh, for women that are having surgery, like a mastectomy or reconstructive surgery, I add inside pockets, and those pockets are to hold the surgical drains. And for anyone who's ever had them, you'll know, you know they would know that that is like such a wonderful addition, uh, because some women can have up to eight drains. And I put pockets on the inside for them to safely and securely have them, and it's much more comfortable. And also, the sleeves of hug wraps are very wide, so they're perfect for patients with any type of lymphedema. And also, they're wide enough to get an IV bag through. Mm-hmm. And because it opens up in the front, there's easy access to a chemo patient who has a port. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no snaps or hooks or metal. So hug wraps can be worn right into the radiation treatment center. And you can also wear them to, you know, CAT scans or any kind of an x-ray or an ultrasound or mm-hmm. uh, doctor's appointments wearing them to mammograms. Um, you can wear them anywhere. The only place that you really can't wear them would be obviously would be like into surgery. Oh, well, you know but what? they're perfect for patients at home recovering because they're so easy to slip on and off. Um, because I, for one, you know, I had surgery on my left breast and I had a very difficult time raising my arm and getting it around. So putting on a regular shirt was impossible. Mm-hmm. And a hug grab is specifically designed that it's simple and easy just by bending your elbow to get these on and off. I think it's a fantastic thing that you're doing, Brenda. And for our listeners out there, I want you to check out uh, hugwraps.org and see what Brenda's doing, how she's doing it. And, Brenda, why don't you let our listeners know how to, uh, again, be on the website, how can they find out more social media and things of that nature? Why don't you give them that information? Yes, I, you know, I've been so blessed with 
a lot of um, media attention for what I do, and you included, Lewis. Thank you for helping me spread the word and find the patients that can benefit from a hug wrap. Mm-hmm. But probably the, the, the nicest thing of all, you know, because wonderful things happen in return to me as well. And I was featured on the NBC TV show, George to the Rescue, and received a two-room makeover, a complete sewing room, and a complete office with beautiful Bernina sewing machines. Mm. And, you know, it was just so wonderful that George Oliphant and the George to the Rescue team came in to rescue me, you know, in order to help me continue to help um, cancer patients. Yeah, George is a good egg. He's a good egg. He's, he does yes. some good stuff out there. Okay, so now yes, uh, what, a, what, what about social media for you? Your Twitter? Um, yes, I've had a lot of... Um, you mean what have I done? What no, has, no, no. I, what, we just want to give the information how people can can find you on Twitter. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Lewis. Uh-huh. Um, yes, I'm I'm on Twitter under Hug Wraps, and I'm also on Facebook under Hug Wraps, and I'm on LinkedIn uh, under my name Brenda Jones. And come find me. I'm on Instagram too. I'm kind of all over the place. All right, you're you're you're, you're all over the place doing stuff. And you know, again, I urge our listeners to check out Hug Wraps, and and see what Brenda's doing. She's doing some wonderful things for some some people that actually need it. And you know what? For those fancy sman- schmancy guys out there and girls, uh, men and women that uh, may want it, you could probably get your initials embroidered on there. And there you go. You, you're, you're hitting the high note, high class. All right, but Brenda, what I want to do is. Thank you for coming on the show, and we're going to have you on uh, as things progress with you, and you just keep doing the great things, and you thanked me. Don't thank me. I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. But, Lois, you know, you're helping me. You know, I, I, I fully appreciate, um, you know, your sentiments, but really, you know, um, having you in my court, you know, and, and having me on your show tells me that you get what I'm doing. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do for cancer patients, and and to me that is the most humbling thing. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're doing um, a great thing. It. You're doing a great thing, Thanks, and sir. you know, and again, I appreciate you taking time to come on and keep doing the great work. And on that note, uh, we're going to let you go, Brenda. And for our listeners, uh, you know, stay with us, and we're going to be right back on Money Never Sleeps right after this quick break. <laughs> October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Did you know that every 19 seconds, someone is diagnosed with breast cancer, and every 74 seconds, someone in the world dies from it? These are not just statistics, but mothers, daughters, sisters, friends. The good news is that about 98% of women who detect and treat breast cancer early experience positive results having at least a five-year relative survival rate, and most of them living with no evidence of the cancer after treatment. So don't let a loved one become another statistic. Be proactive, especially during this Breast Cancer Awareness Month. First, get better informed about this disease by visiting websites such as the National Breast Cancer Organization or the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And then help spread the word by making sure your daughter knows about self-breast exams encouraging your friends to get a yearly mammogram, urging your loved ones to go for their regular checkup once a year, and last but not least, making time for yourself to schedule an appointment with your doctor. These are all simple ways you can help your family, friends, and yourself to detect breast cancer before it progresses. From the MacFM community, we want you to know that you can make a difference in the fight against breast cancer. Remember, early detection is our best protection. Millionaire business mogul Marcus Limonis is the profit. In two seasons, he's invested over $7 million of his own money to save struggling businesses. If you want to be successful in business, there's only three things I want you to focus on. People, process, and product. Determine if you have the right people and if you're motivating them and managing them the right way. Look at your process and determine, is it streamlined? Is it efficient? Can you get better? And look at your product. Because even if your product is good today, I don't want to find out that it's obsolete tomorrow. 
All right, welcome back to Money Never Sleeps, and that's about it for this week. So I hope that you got something out of it, and I hope that you're going to join us next week as we bring on uh, Matt Shotwell of uh, Weed Country, and we're going to have some other great guests on the show, so make sure you check us out next Monday. And uh, in the meantime, as I always say, uh, if you have any questions, any comments, feel free to reach out to me on social media or via ucwmagazine.com, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Until then, I hope that everyone uh, has an extremely profitable week. And again, let me leave you with this. Always do your due diligence and become an informed investor, whether it's the stock market, real estate, whatever it may be. Okay, but we'll be back with you next Monday. And thank you. Initiating shutdown sequence. You're listening to UCW Radio in your face. What is your major malfunction? So let it be written. So let it be done. Ladies and gentlemen, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my sister thanks you, and I thank you.